Acts chapter number 16, very, very, very familiar uh, passage of Scripture, uh, a wonderful account in the Scriptures. We'll begin reading verse 22. The Bible says, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Lord, we thank you for the good testimonies. We thank you for being a good God. We thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Now, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help us from the Scriptures. I pray that, Lord, you'd instill something in us that will propel us and help us over any obstacle or anything that we face in the days that lie ahead. Lord, we're excited, looking forward to what you're going to do for our church in the, in the days and weeks ahead. We certainly do pray you'd bless our visitation program tomorrow night, and the Bible college uh, on Tuesday night, and service again on Wednesday night. We're just excited to see what the Lord has in store. Now bless, bless those working with the the young people over on the other side of the building tonight, bless their efforts, help those young people do something special for them. And then, God, we certainly do pray for these in attendance in the sanctuary you'd bless as well. Father, I pray you'd receive honor and glory. Use this unworthy vessel. And, Father, we'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen and amen. In these verses we find where Paul and Silas... Uh, uh, experience one of the great miracles of the New Testament. Let me say something about them. First of all, they're brought before the magistrates. They've been misunderstood. Can I say that Paul and Silas was down there uh, uh, in Philippi trying to be a blessing and there was a woman vexed with the devil following them around, driving them absolutely crazy. Now, this one vexed with the devil didn't say anything that wasn't true. She was saying that these were servants of the Most High God, uh, and they come to proclaim the way of salvation. Uh, but can I say, even though what she was saying was true, the spirit behind it uh, was demeaning, and the spirit behind it uh, was grieving the Holy Ghost in Paul and Silas. Uh, and Paul uh, pulled a Popeye, he stands all he could stand, he couldn't stand no more, uh, and he cast the demon out of that woman. Well, the problem was is she belonged to some men that made a lot of money off of her, uh, doing some fortune telling, some other things. Well, they didn't like it. So they brought Paul and Silas before the whole magistrate, uh, accusing them of things they weren't guilty of. They were misunderstood. Can I say then they were misjudged? Uh, they, they said that these men were bringing things that weren't lawful to be taught in their city. That wasn't the case at all. These men got feelings hurt because their, their money machine was now gone. So they've been misunderstood, they've been misjudged, and then we find they're mistreated. The Bible said they laid many stripes on them, threw them into prison, charged the jailer to keep them safely, and they put them in the innermost part of the prison and bound their feet with stocks. Uh, we find um, Paul and Silas are put in prison for number one, doing right. They're put in prison for believing right. And they're put in, they're put in prison for being right. Mm, didn't change the fact they still went to prison. Now, my throat lets me. I'm going to try and help you tonight. 
you and I are subject to go to prison. Now, I'm not talking to one where Brother Josh and Brother Phil go every Sunday morning and preach down here at Boone County Jail. I'm not talking about one with bars and, and locked you in there. I'm talking about different kinds of prisons. You and I might be subject to put in, be put into a prison of sorrow. Can I say there are some people that believe right, they do right, they are right, but for whatever reason, the lot that the Lord cast on them is a life of heartache, a life of sorrow, a life of pain. Uh, uh, I'm thinking in my mind uh, of people I've known. Uh, seems like uh, 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 they loved God, they lived for God, they served God, but there was always something tragic happening in their home life. Uh, they always had uh, uh, some part of heartache in their life and some part of sorrow in their life. Uh, that just seemed to be their prison. Uh, uh, even though uh, uh, God loved them and even though they loved God, they still seem to have a prison of sorrow. Uh, uh, there are some folks uh, that have a prison of sickness. Uh, 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 listen, uh, 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 for whatever reason, it just seems like they're sick or sickly. Uh, there's always uh, uh, something or some element of sickness in their life. Uh, they love God. They serve God. They want to be faithful to God, but they're constantly battling some sickness. Uh, uh, my mind's uh, going back now to a preacher down uh, in Pickens, South Carolina by the name of Dr. Rudy Smith. Uh, Dr. Rudy Smith's wife uh, never left a hospital bed the last 20 years of her life. Uh, and uh, I've heard the story where he patted her on the hand and said, uh, Mama, we get to heaven, we're going to find out about all this. Uh, and she said, Honey, when we get to heaven, it won't even matter anymore. Uh, uh, there are some people uh, that just have sickness. Uh, there are some people that just have sorrow. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, there are some people who have the prison of stress. Uh, they're always stressed out. Uh, they're always worrying. It's their nature to worry about everything and stress about everything. Uh, they're anxious about everything. Uh, that just seems to be their prison. Uh, there are some people that got droopy prison. They always seem to have sadness. Uh, they're always just sad. They're always walk walking on their lower lip. Uh, I don't understand that. Uh, I, I, I've never been in that prison. Uh, I'm not throwing off on them. Uh, uh, you'd hope to see a smile on their face from time to time. Uh, but there's some people just, uh, they're in a prison of sadness all the time. Uh, doesn't mean they don't love the Lord. Uh, doesn't mean that the Lord don't love them. Uh, doesn't mean they're not right with God. Uh, they just face a prison of sadness. Uh, there's some people, uh, I've met this person a lot, uh, there's some people that are in the prison of skepticism. Uh, they're always skeptic. Uh, they're skeptic of everything. Uh, skeptic of whether or not God will bless. Uh, skeptic of whether or not God will take care of his people. Uh, skeptic about preachers. Uh, skeptic about uh, folks in the church. Uh, they're always just skeptic about everything. That's a miserable prison to live in. Uh, now if it's coming out of Washington you ought to be skeptic. But you can't be skeptic about everything. Uh, now, I know infomercials are a bunch of bunk, but there are some things in life that you don't have to be skeptic about. Uh, but there's some people in that prison. There's some people in the prison of suppression. They just feel constrained and pressed down all the time. Like the weight of the world is on them all the time. What a prison. Again, all these things doesn't mean that these people don't love God and that God don't love them, that they're not right with God, that they don't uh, want to serve God. They're just in prisons. Uh, and can I say there are some people that may be a prison of their surroundings. Their workplace is their prison. They hate going to work. That's a lot of people. You know, work is a four-letter word. But if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Huh? People don't work because it's a thrill. They work because they want to put food on their table and pay their bills. Huh? But can I say that some people hate their jobs. They hate work. But they do it anyway because that's what God's blessed them to do. Uh, doesn't mean they hate God or God hates them. They just hate their job. It's their, their, their surrounding, their work is a prison. Huh? They have no joy while they're on the job. Some people... Uh, 
It may be uh, 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 their social atmosphere, those that they run with and those that they hang out with and those they spend time with may actually be a prison. It may actually uh, bind them and keep them from the joys of the Lord. Some people, their very home is their prison. The only relief they get is when they come to church. I've known people, I'm, I'm thinking right now, Miss Brenda Corbin. Those of you that wasn't here years ago didn't know Miss Brenda. What a lady who loved God. Amen. Sugar diabetes took her eyesight, took her legs. She's in a wheelchair. She's married to a lost man. Lost man that would make her life a living hell. Say, so how'd she get back at him? She played preaching tapes all the time, drove him nuts. Uh, but he'd leave to go to work. Miss Brenda in a wheelchair with no legs, and he wouldn't get a cup down for where she'd get a drink of water the whole time she's, he's gone to work. She told Miss Annette one time when she's in the hospital, the bruises would heal, but the mental anguish would just weigh on her. And she says, I can't leave him because I'm the only gospel witness he has. He'd bring her to church. Some of you men would, will remember this. He'd open that back door and just shove her in. He'd deliberately bring her late. Wouldn't even let her know she's going to get to come to church or not. He'd deliberately do that. And they'd just shove her in the back door. Huh? See, her home was her prison. Church was her release. And boy, she loved coming to church. She loved worshiping the Lord. I said all that to say there are folks that are facing prisons. You live long enough, something to get a hold on you too. Amen. And there are folks in a prison. And I got to thinking about all this. Yes, I just happened to be doing a little study and I found myself reading this wonderful text. And I want to preach on this thought. I want to preach on what the prison cannot do. Paul and Silas is in prison. But can I say the prison wasn't in them? Amen. Some of you get a hold of that. Uh, the prison did not limit them, even though the prison would destroy many. There are some things the prison cannot do. Can I say that the prison cannot keep you from offering supplication? Look again, if you will, there in verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas had a pity party. Is that what it said? I mean, they've just been uh, 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 mistreated. They're misunderstood. They've been beaten with many stripes. They've been thrown into prison. Uh, I mean, they're minding their own business. They're trying to do work for the Lord. Uh, that demon-vexed woman got on Paul's nerves. Uh, he actually did the best thing he could ever done for that woman. He uh, exercised that demon out of her. Uh, and here they are uh, at midnight uh, in this prison. Uh, and all of a sudden, Paul looks at Silas and said, I believe we need to pray. Uh, think about it. Can I say a lot of times we stub our toe. The last thing on our mind is praying. Uh, we wonder why, why God's been so, so mean to us to put that thing in our way that causes us to stub our toe or that we want to uh, suck on our thumb or we want to uh, uh, just sit up and, uh, and crawl up in a ball and, and think God's mad at us. No, Paul and Silas are in prison, uh, been beaten half to death. Uh, uh, this was nothing new to the apostle Paul. He'd been beaten before uh, and he looks over at Silas. Maybe this is uh, 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 one of the worst times Silas has ever faced in his Christian life. Uh, Paul says, you know what we need, Si? Uh, we just need to pray. Uh, and the prison cannot keep you uh, from offering up supplication uh, and talking to God. Uh, and even though they were bound, uh, even though they were in prison uh, uh, through the uh, uh, avenue of grabbing the horns of the altar, uh, getting a hold of heaven, uh, hey, they dispatched all the way to the third heaven, uh, walked into the throne room of God, uh, had a conversation with Almighty God uh, and God took note of it uh, and God got to speaking back uh, and God got so big uh, we find an earthquake come and broke the prison open uh, 
Why? Because Paul and Silas uh, did not let the prison dictate to them. Uh, they just went on and served God anyway. Huh? The prison cannot keep you from offering supplication. It cracks me up. They say it's illegal to pray in school. Says who? The only thing keeping people from praying in school is the people that doesn't pray in school. Huh? You say, well, you can't have an organized thing. Who says? Why don't you just, uh, some of you young people just stand up one day and say, you know what, I think we just need to pray and just start praying. See, what are they going to do? Huh? Yeah. Say, well, I'll get expelled. What better thing to be expelled for because you had a conversation with God? Right. Huh? Now, Colton, I'm not putting anything in your mind. <laughs> but if you do it, I'll stand with you, all right? Amen. Uh, Brother Brian's going, oh, Lord have mercy. Don't tempt Colton with that, huh? I'm just telling you, the prison can't keep you from offering up supplication. Nobody can keep you from talking to God. And I say this, the prison can't keep you from singing. Look what happens there in verse 25. They got to praying, and then they began to sing praises unto God. Huh? All of a sudden, Simon might have said, Paul, what was that one song you liked? He said, I like that, uh, what a day it's going to be, or something like that. And Simon said, I like that one too. And they just started singing it uh, to the top of their lungs. Uh, can you imagine what all them other prisoners thought? Some of them probably been beat too. Or some of them definitely are wallering in their self-pity. Well, who's them two clowns that they just drug in here and beat half to death, and they're down there praying, and now they're singing? What in the world is going on with that cell? Well, they're about to find out. Can I say this? That pity puts the focus on us. Praise puts the focus on the, on the Lord Jesus. Amen. They began to sing praises unto God. And all of a sudden, those that were in there wallowing in their self-pity started hearing about one named Jesus. And now the focus is on Jesus and not why they're in the prison. Hmm? You, you say, preacher, did it really have that profound effect? Oh, yeah. Because when the earthquake happened, none of them left. If they'd still been focusing on themselves, they would have hightailed it out of there. But they stayed. Why? Because they heard something happening down there they'd never heard about anymore or before. And they need, to, they need to find out more about all that. Huh? I mean, when you get to talking to God and get to singing about God and God shows up so big it breaks open the prison, something is going on. Amen. Hmm? Right. Some of them jokers, it wasn't their first to go around in jail. And some of them been there a long time. And they'd heard a lot of people praying, but not praying like these guys had prayed. They were praying to get out. These were just praying, talking to God. Huh? I'm just telling you, the prison can't keep you from singing. Can I say Isaiah 61 3 says there's a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness? No matter what you're going through, if you'll break out in a song of praise unto the Lord, it'll lift your spirit. It'll help you. It'll help you in the midst of your prison, regardless of what kind of prison you, you're, you're facing. And even when temptation comes, just start singing to the Lord. Temptation will flee. It'll lift your spirit. Thank the Lord for, for a song in due season. Huh? I'm just saying some things the prison can't do. It can't keep you from offering supplication. can't keep you from singing. can't keep you from sharing the gospel. So I'm in a prison. What am I supposed to do? Well, try giving the gospel to somebody. The Lord Jesus did say after the Holy Ghost was come upon you, you'd have power to be witnesses unto him in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. You want the power of God in your life? Start telling somebody else about Jesus. See if the Lord don't help you. See if he don't show you up. See if he don't bless you. Huh? Just start passing out tracts if nothing else. It can't keep you from being a light and a witness for the Lord. You can share the gospel. Huh? And look, none of them fellows left the place. Mm -mm. And then when the jailer found out, I mean, he's about ready to take his life. Now, how did Paul and Silas know that? 
He supposed they's all fled, and he pulls out his sword and going to take his own life. How did Paul and Silas know that? It's called discernment. The Lord probably said, hey, Paul, you might want to say something right about now. And he said, hey, do thyself no harm. We're all here. That freaked him out. Why? Because if he'd been in the prison, he'd have left. Hmm? That is amazing. None of the prisoners could sleep while Paul and Silas was praying and talking to God and singing unto God, but the jailer did. But God knew how to wake him up. And when he realized what was happening, in verse number 30 he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That word must is in your Bible 120 times. Hmm. There's some things we must do and some things we must run from. But this fellow said, what must I do to be saved? He knew enough to know one thing. They had something he didn't have. Yeah. And of course, Paul and Silas shared the gospel. Verse 31, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved in thy house. Huh? Say, so what happened? He got saved. His household got saved. Took him out. He washed their stripes. And they baptized him. I'm talking about something happened at Philippian jail. Hmm? Yeah. If you study the life of Paul, he wanted to go to Philippi in the Macedonia long before this. But the Lord wouldn't permit him to do so. Why? Because the Philippian jailer wasn't ready yet. The Lord was still working in his life, even though he didn't know the Lord was working in his life. He had Paul and Silas right down there in the right place at the right time so God could do a work. Say what happened? A church got established. A church of Philippi, that's what established. Uh, 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 what happened? God did a great work. Uh, yeah, Paul and Silas had to suffer a little bit, uh, but God in the end got glory from it. Uh, and free you might be in a prison, uh, uh, but if you continue to serve God, seek to uh, uh, live for the Lord, uh, don't let your prison control your life. Uh, God may do something great out of your prison. Uh, there's no telling folks that might get saved, folks that might get help. Uh, don't let your or prison hinder you from being what God wants you to be. Uh, the prison couldn't keep them from offering up supplication, couldn't keep them from singing, couldn't keep them from sharing the gospel. Prison can't keep you from making a stand. So they're in prison. They still make a stand for the Lord. And can I say, you may be suffering something tonight, but you can still make a stand for Jesus. Brother Ron, driving a truck for UDF wasn't the best thing that you could have been doing at your age when you retired. But I guarantee you, your co-workers knew you loved the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then what had God do? He delivered you from the prison, let you retire. What a blessing, huh? Amen. What I'm trying to say is, even though you may be in a prison facing something, suffering something, putting up with something, you can still make a stand. God honors that. Hmm? Matter of fact, that might be why God has you in the prison. So you can make a stand. Hmm? Uh, listen, we live in a day and age where a lot of Christians wouldn't make a stand if their life depended on it. Amen. Heard all my life, I'd be willing to die for Jesus, but they won't come to church. If you can't live for him, you won't die for him. Right. Huh? Matter of fact, you better be very, very careful making them bold claims. Peter did the same thing, and when it came down to it, Peter, Peter cussed the Lord and then took off and running. Yes, sir. You don't know what you'll do in the, in the, and under any given circumstances. Right. You ought to pray and say, well, the Lord willing, I hope that I'll stand. But never let God... You know, never tempt God to let you find out whether or not you'll stand. It'd just be good to make a stand regardless where you find yourself. That way, if you find yourself in prison, your character won't change. Hmm? There's a lot of folks, they boast and claim a lot of things till the fire gets on. If you're not doing it when there is no persecution, you won't do it when there is persecution. Hmm? Just go ahead and start making stands for Jesus. It counts. Hmm? Folks ought to know where you stand. Whether they agree with you or not, they ought to know where you stand. 
Sydney was witnessing to somebody a couple years ago, told them about our church, and then the person tuned it in online, and then when Sydney saw the person next time, uh, they referred to something I said. Sydney said, oh, yeah, he said that. He'd probably say a lot worse if you hang around, huh? But the truth of the matter is she made a stand. She didn't back up and apologize for something that her father made a stand on. Good, bad, or indifferent, folks know where I stand on certain things. Say, so where do you stand, preacher? Where the Bible does. If God's against it, we need to be against it. God's for it, we need to be for it. And people ought to know what we're for and what we're against. Huh? You know what the world doesn't need? Wishy-washy Christians. In one day and out the other. Huh? Listen, folks ought to know when it's church time, you're going to be in church. You say, well, but my family has this going on and that going on. They ought, to, they ought to know that, hey, we got church. Amen. You want me to be there, I'll be there after or before, but I'm going to church. Yep. Why don't you come to church with me? You ought to make a stand. Amen. People ought to know where you stand on the Bible. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. When I talk about the Bible, I talk about the King James Bible. That's the Word of God for English-speaking people. I don't need anything else. People ought to know where you stand. People ought to know where you stand. I go to a Baptist church. I am a Baptist. I'm nothing else. I'm a Baptist. And I'm not ashamed of being a Baptist. And you ought to know why you're a Baptist. Huh? You ought to not be ashamed to make a stand. Huh? Say, when we go to church, we don't, we don't look a certain way. We look a different way. And we, we go to eat, we, don't, we always pray over our food. And, and we do, just make a stand. You say, what if I offend people? So what? I'd rather offend them and they know where I stand and maybe they'll come to trust in the Lord than not offend them and they die and go to hell. I'm not trying to offend them, but if the Bible offends them, they'll have to be offended. I'm not trying to offend them. I want to be liked by everybody. I want to be nice to everybody. I want to be kind to everybody. But there are certain things in this Bible that the world finds offensive. You go to church three times a week? That's offensive. How come you go three times a week? Because that's the only time we have service. If we had it five times, I'd go five times a week. Amen. Uh, there's just some people, they just don't understand. Well, if they met the Lord, they'd understand. They'd realize that we was that crippled sheep. And the shepherd came by and picked us up when we should have been thrown off away. They, they, they have a better understanding. Well, that went over real good. But the prison can't keep you from making a stand. Amen. The only thing that keep you from making a stand is your insecurity. Amen. You letting the devil get the victory over you because you're insecure. Uh, I thought about this lastly. The prison can't keep you from showing up. You ought to show up to work. You ought to show up to school. You ought to show up to church. You ought to show up everywhere you show up. You ought to show up, and you ought to show up with Jesus in your heart and on your mind and on your face. Prison can't keep you from showing up. Hmm? There's a lot of people that arrive, but they don't show up. There's a difference. There's a difference in being here and being here. There's some people that may be here, but their mind might be out there. There might be somebody that shows up on the job and they've hit the time clock, but they're doing this the whole time they're on, on the job and somebody else is doing their work for them. They didn't show up. Are you listening? Uh, there are people in attendance, so that don't mean they show up. We ought to show up regardless of the circumstances in our life. Years ago when I was in sales, I used to, and I've said this here before, but I, I used to tell them, salesmen cannot have a bad day. Because it's kind of sales we was talking about, Brother Adrian. They didn't sell, they didn't eat. It was 100% commission. And if you let whatever happened at the house affect you on the job, you wasn't going to eat. 
If you let whatever happened in traffic affect you on the job, you wasn't going to eat. You couldn't have a bad day. I had a big sign over the back door going into the, to the showroom. Salespeople cannot have a bad day. Well, let me help you something. Christians can't have a bad day. You have a bad day at school, Colton, and blow your testimony. None of your, none of your classmates are ever going to come to church with you. You can't have a bad day. Now, I know they're going to get on your nerves. You know why I know that? Because they're people. I got news. You're going to get on their nerves. Why? Because you're a person. But you can't have a bad day. That's tough being at your age. It's tough because, you know, you're wanting to draw a line in the sand and pop somebody in the nose. You can't do that. you got to have a good day. You got to realize they're doing what they're doing out of ignorance. You be the better person. Show them you love Jesus. Can't have a bad day. I know you want to. I've seen you play basketball. You're the best fowler I've ever seen. <laughs> that boy gets his money's worth on a foul. I mean, that last game I seen him play, he might as well have put a saddle on the boy and rode him. I mean, it was something. <laughs> That boy went in for a layup, and then he found Colton. Woo, it was wonderful. That was the best foul I've seen in a long time. I mean, that had brought Shaquille O'Neal down. I mean, he hit that kid, huh? That kid was hurting three days after that, huh? But we're talking about going to school. You can't, you can't foul people in school. You just got to have a good attitude. It's hard sometimes. Christians can't have a bad day. We can't have a bad day when we come to church. Can't let what happened at the house, can't happen what, let what happened in traffic. We come to church, there is somebody here that might need to get to Jesus. And if we have a bad day, we might grieve the Holy Ghost. And they can't get to Jesus. We can't have a bad day. Huh? The best thing that I ever had to do was have to drive 50 miles to church. Because then you got your mind off everything else and got your mind on the Lord. But just living down the street, man, you got you got to really hurry it up and get your mind on the Lord. I'm glad I'm not Brother Adrian, huh? I don't know. I guess I guess he's a little closer than the Schneckenbergers. I don't know. But I mean, no, you're closer than him. You always have a bad day, though, Joseph. You're always in trouble. What's the deal? I mean, how can you get in trouble at school? You never leave the house, huh? No, Joseph, good boy. I'm just saying, as Christians, we can't have a bad day. We need to show up every time we walk through those doors ready to worship. Amen. The prison can't keep us from showing up. Amen. I mean, when we went to all the trouble of coming, we might as well show up and be all in Amen. and put our whole heart into worship, yeah. our whole heart into the service. Whoever's singing, we ought to be in on it. We ought to say, hallelujah, what a blessing. That's good. Huh? Who's ever uh, testifying, we ought to say, praise the Lord. That's good, huh? Hey, when the offering plate comes around, we ought to throw something in there. That's good. Hallelujah. When the preacher's preaching, we ought to be engaged and listening and applying it to our life because whatever it is, we're going to need on down the road. I'm just telling you, the prison did not dictate to Paul and Silas. They were real regardless of their, their circumstances. And the prison can't keep you Regard, and I know what you're facing is real. What they faced was real. But it did not define them. And do not let your heartache, your sorrow, your troubles, whatever you're facing, define you. Let Jesus Christ define you. And you'll be amazed at how many people will want what you have. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song. Miss Tina, if you'll come to the piano. Maybe you just need to come and say, Lord, help me. You know better than I what I'm facing. God help me to stay strong and stay true. Maybe tonight the Lord puts somebody on your heart you need to pray for. Why don't you come pray for them? Maybe tonight you just need to come and thank the Lord for being so good to you that you ought to be in a real prison paying for crimes that you committed, but the Lord forgave you and He saved you and He put grace in your life. Maybe the Lord spoke to you about something totally different. Maybe you need to come tonight. They're, they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're certainly grateful for the things that did not define Paul and Silas as far as the jail.
but they impacted all those that were present just because they did what they were supposed to do. They were talking to you and praising you. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us. Lord, we face real circumstances, real situations, real problems, but help those things not define us. Help us to be true to you, and God, help us to impact other people's lives by just praying and praising God and being real. Now, God, speak to hearts now. God, I know it wasn't a salvation message. If there's anybody here unsaved, I pray you'd convict them and save them. But God, I pray for these in the altar and those that are praying in the pews. God, you just bless them and help them. Help us, Lord, to always be pleasing unto the Lord. Blessing this invitation. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.